Starship is fully stacked again. We've had two launch failures in two days and much more has been happening in a busy New Year's period. This is Tomorrow Space News. As always, let's start off the episode by seeing what SpaceX has been up to at Starbase. Booster 7 has rolled out to the orbital launch pad for what we think will be the final time. Of course, we thought the last time was the final time, so we can never be certain, but it does seem likely. A few hours after B7 was placed onto the launch mount, Ship 24 joined the Super Heavy booster once again ahead of pre-launch full stack testing. And before B7 and S24 could even get a chance to begin testing, younger sibling Ship 25 was already rolling down the highway towards the launch site ahead of testing on that individual ship. Let's peer over to the orbital pad though as Booster 7 was getting filled up with some methane and oxygen. This was just a partial fueling test but you must start small and work your way up to mitigate the chance of a rapid unscheduled explosion at the tail end of the vehicle. Fingers crossed, good progress from these smaller tests will lead to a successful full wet dress rehearsal of the entire stack before a 33 engine static fire and the launch of the decade. How do I know that's the plan? Because SpaceX tweeted it. Ever since SpaceX started launching Starlink satellites in big batches, astronomers have been grumbling about the lasting impact on the night sky of such a large constellation. The engineers behind Starlink have been working to make them less reflective, but they are still getting in the way of observations, especially after launch. I think it's safe to assume that most astronomers will keep grumbling, but SpaceX and the National Science Foundation have agreed to work towards making the Starlink problem a lot less worse. The new agreement is known as an Astronomy Coordination Agreement, which was a condition in the FCC license that allows SpaceX to operate its brand new Gen 2 constellation. They've agreed to continue working to reduce the satellite's brightness in the sky, making them invisible to the naked eye and less impactful on sensitive astronomical equipment. This is still voluntary though, there's no law forcing SpaceX to put itself in this position and the National Science Foundation have praised the company for being a leader in reducing the impact their constellation will have on the night sky. Personally, I do hope that other large constellations in the works, <clears throat> Amazon's Kuiper, also work towards reducing the brightness of their satellites. I think it'd be interesting to gauge the community's opinion on this, so make sure to let us know in the comments whether you think these measures should be taken or Starlink Gen 2 should just be banned from launching altogether. Speaking of Starlink, the aviation service has a new commercial customer, being the Latvian flag carrier Air Baltic. Their entire fleet, which is 100% composed of Airbus A220 300s, will be connected to the internet service, providing customers on board with some high bandwidth. Air Baltic is following in the footsteps of short-haul American carrier JSX, who are offering Starlink to all customers on board their fleet of Embraer aircraft for no additional cost. Every passenger on board all Air Baltic flights will have a Starlink connection added on as a complimentary bonus without, quote, hassles or login pages. This announcement makes Air Baltic the first carrier who serve Europe to join the Starlink Aviation Service, following on from the first, the aforementioned JSX, and Hawaiian Airlines, who are working on implementing the service into their Trans-Pacific fleet of A321neos, A330s, and new Boeing 7879s. I'm still waiting for one of the big transatlantic players to pick up the service, especially when these speeds cost me 12 great British pounds for a total of four hours aboard a British Airways 777. Virgin Atlantic, I think you know what you've got to do if you want to sway me over. United Launch Alliance CEO Tory Bruno has been on a Twitter video sharing spree recently, giving us an inside look onto the transportation of the company's next generation launch vehicle, Vulcan. What you just saw was Vulcan's core stage being transported towards ULA's rocket ship, which is how they transport their large rocket components by water. Yeah, their rocket carrying ship is called Rocket Ship. Tori also shared this video of the latest generation of the Centaur upper stage, Centaur 5, being loaded onto Rocket Ship alongside the core stage. At the time of writing, Rocket Ship is currently scheduled to arrive in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at 2200 local time tonight, the day of this episode's release, according to marinetraffic.com. It is super exciting to see all of the hardware now starting to head towards and congregate around Cape Canaveral because all of the epic launches that have always been in the future are so close to the present. Vulcan is one of those future rockets that always felt just out of reach, but finally, it's actually happening. 
The flame down the side of the core stage is also an epic design feature that I'd wish more rocket companies would catch on to. Yes, in fairness, a more complicated livery is going to add more mass, reducing your mass to orbit metric, but so many rockets are just white with text, maybe a logo, maybe a flag, but that's all. I think it's safe to say that for the time being, Vulcan is going to be the coolest looking launch vehicle at the Cape. Space traffic time and the first launch, we're heading to China as at 0504 Universal Time on Monday, January the 9th, Galactic Energy launched this Ceres-1 rocket with five satellites on board, which are Xiamen SciTech-1, Tianqi-13, Tianmu-101 and Tianmu-102, and Nantong Shongshu. This flight originated from Site-95 at the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center and the payloads were delivered to a sun-synchronous orbit. Next up, it's the maiden flight from the UK with Virgin Orbit's Start Me Up mission launching out of Spaceport Cornwall. Cosmic Girl departed Newquay just after 2200 UTC, also on Monday, and flew out to just southwest of Cork, Ireland, before air launching Launcher 1 and carrying six small sats to orbit. Well, at least it was meant to. Sadly, Virgin Orbit is currently calling it an anomaly in the second stage, which shut down the first burn early, meaning the vehicle was unable to achieve a stable orbit and it soon re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. The only official number we have so far is that this occurred 180 kilometers up with no official re-entry location. However, after cross-checking the time of the launch and the footage, this light streak observed from Lanzarote could be the re-entry of Launcher 1. This is just educated speculation, but it does make sense. Around the same time that Cosmic Girl was leaving New Key, SpaceX's CRS-26 Cargo Dragon was leaving the International Space Station, ending its 43-day tenure docked to the Zenith port on the Harmony module. Being a cargo resupply mission, there was no broadcast of the capsule's return, which splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico at 10.19 UTC on Wednesday. From the world's newest spaceport, we go to one of the world's oldest, with SpaceX launching OneWeb 16 at 0450 UTC on Tuesday the 10th from Slick 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. All six metric tons of OneWeb satellites were successfully delivered to their polar low Earth orbit, marking a successful end to SpaceX's second mission for the London headquarters Interdeck Communications Company. Of course, the cherry on top was a textbook landing by booster B1076 on landing zone 1. Through 2022's most flown rocket, we now go to a brand new rocket as ABL Space Systems attempted not only the first flight of their RS-1 rocket, but the company's first flight as well. After many scrubs since mid-November because of a variety of weather and data issues, the time finally came and RS-1 left launch pad 3C at the Pacific Spaceport Complex in Kodiak, Alaska at 23.27 UTC on Tuesday. Sadly, just a few seconds into flight, RS-1 very quickly returned to pad 3C, crashing down and causing damage to the pad infrastructure. And thanks to Harry Stranger on Twitter, we can have a look at this damage even if Sentinel-2 only has a resolution of 10 meters per pixel. The pad area is visibly much more brown. The next three launches are all from China, starting with AP Star 6E, which was launched on this Long March 2C at 1810 Universal on Thursday the 12th from LC3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. AP Star 6E is a communications satellite from the Hongkonese company APT Satellite, designed to serve the Asia Pacific region of the Earth with telecom services. The following flight from China had many payloads, which were launched on this Long March 2D from Site 9401 at the Jiaquan Satellite Launch Center at 0700 Universal on Friday, the 13th of January. On board was the Aragon 37, a classified military reconnaissance satellite, and Cheyenne 22A and 22B, two Earth observation satellites. These are placed into a low Earth orbit. The seventh launch of the week was another Long March 2D, this time being from LC9 at the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center. This vehicle left the pad at 0314 UTC on Sunday the 15th, carrying six Julian 1 observation satellites as well as Kilu 2 and Kilu 3, which are also Earth observation satellites. All of the payloads were delivered to a sun-synchronous orbit. And to round out the week, we had the triple core self-landing beast that is Falcon Heavy, launching USSF-67 from historic launch complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. 
flying this mission were side calls B1064 and B1065, which previously flew the USS F-44 mission last year, and a brand new expended center core B-1070. Being a US Space Force mission, the payloads were classified, but we were given their names. The primary mission is the Continuous Broadcast Augmenting SATCOM, shortened to CBAS-2, a military communications and relay satellite, and the ride share is the Long Duration Propulsive ESPER. This payload name has an initialism within an acronym, making its full name the Long Duration Propulsive Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Secondary Payload Adapter. Of course, as expected, the two side corps successfully returned to landing zones 1 and 2 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, getting prepared for the next mission, which is currently scheduled to be USS F-52 in April. Coming up over the next week, we have the following launches. On Wednesday, SpaceX will be flying GPS-3 Space Vehicle 6. Then on Thursday, SpaceX will be flying out of Vandenberg with Mission 4 of the second Starlink group. And then we're back to the East Coast on Monday with Rocket Lab's maiden flight out of Wallops, Virginia. A big thank you to every single citizen of tomorrow who helped to support the show financially. Station 204 is not cheap to operate and the support of the ground support, suborbital, orbital, escape velocity and Plaid Pro Plus citizens helps to pay for the space, pun intended. You can find out more information at join.tmro.tv or by clicking the join button below. Do you want some more stuff to watch? Well, there's a few things you could watch right now with a live show coming up on Friday. If you haven't already, make sure to check out part two of my documentary on the history of British spaceflight. In the latest episode, I cover everything from Britain's nuclear weapons to the lipstick rocket. Looking further ahead in the week on Tuesday, the space weather woman herself, Dr. Tamitha Scope, will return with a solar update. And on Friday, as I mentioned, myself and Jared will be trying to keep the wheelless train that is the Tomorrow Live Show on the rails. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the news. Thank you so much for watching and goodbye.